We would now begin with our fourth panel discussion on the topic cross border MA transactions from a different perspective, current trends and challenges. Conrad F. Titus will be moderating the panel. Our guest speakers for this panel discussion are Anjali Sivaraman Krishnan, Anirvan Sen, Jeff Disrochus, and Siddharth Hoffman. Also, please feel free to share any questions that, we, that you may have in the QA box, and our panelists will be happy to address them. Over to you, Conrad. Thank you so much uh, for the intro. Short intro saves us time, right? We want to conclude uh, the session on time. And again, what you just said is important for all of the participants. You can always, during our discussion, come up with a, a question either in the chat or ideally in the, in the Q&A button that you can see on the right hand side. And I will then uh, follow uh, and probably stop uh, uh, the panel uh, and take your question. So let's start with the introduction before I'm going to give a, a quick intro into what you're going to uh, hear uh, later on. My name is Conrad, Conrad Deiters. I'm, I'm a Mercer consultant. I'm a partner since 2007 in m and I'm currently leading our global commercial m and business worldwide. And uh, yeah, uh, my pleasure is to talk to you today about uh, the trends and challenges in the industry and also the markets where we can see after a record year last year, uh, you know, M&A activity. And we will do deeper dives in several uh, topics on that. But before I'm going to continue, uh, Anjali, do you want to introduce yourself uh, to the audience as well? Anjali is on mute. Uh, Anjali? Probably Siddharth, why, why don't you continue? Sure, sure. Thanks, Conrad. Um, I'm Anthil Hadnasin. I'm a partner at Latham and Watkins. Um, I'm based in Singapore. I previously worked in New York and Hong Kong, uh, all throughout doing sort of M&A, cross-border M&A and private equity. Uh, I, I'm, I must say I'm a, I'm a self-professed deal junkie. Uh, I love all aspects of deal making, uh, from acting as a connector to finding sort of win-win uh, ways to bridge gaps uh, on, on M&A transactions. Uh, very excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion today. Excellent. Thanks, Siddharth. Uh, based in Singapore, but currently in India, right? That's correct. <laughs> Excellent. So, Anirvan, do you want to continue? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Anirvan Sen. I'm the CEO of uh, Fifth Chrome. We are a boutique consulting company specializing in business strategy advisory and training. Um, our specializations include the entire lifecycle M&A, but focusing more on the M&A integration side of things have been involved in deals uh, for the last 25 years across yeah, um, across the geographies across uh, the price range large deals um, back in GE but also some of the mid-size and smaller deals and I've been involved in setting up private equities and working very closely with transaction advisors currently based in Amsterdam originally sort of Indo-Bangladeshi in origin and I've lived in different parts of the world including China and Singapore so that's me and um I'm delighted to be part of the discussion today. Excellent. Look forward to the conversation. So, Jeff, uh, do you want to introduce yourself as well to the audience? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me participate. Um, my name is Jeff DeRoche. I am uh, <clears throat> VP of uh, Strategy and Corporate Development for VAT Group. Uh, VAT is uh, the leading uh, vacuum valve manufacturer in the uh, in the world, primarily in the semiconductor industry, but also other industrial manufacturing, scientific and R&D applications. Uh, I've been doing um, M&A for a corporate development activities for about 15 years or so, um, and typically full full life cycle, uh, everything from you know strategy development through deal origination to uh, uh, close deal closing and, and integration. As well, and uh, you know, I've always really, really enjoyed the, uh, the the field, the topic. It's very exciting, and um, again, I, I appreciate the, the ability to participate in the discussion. No, excellent, very welcome, uh, and with your broad responsibility, I'm pretty sure people are very interested to hear from you. Anjali, you finally made it, uh, as I can see. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, loud and clear. Oh, now it's much better. Perfect. Perfect. Would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. 
So it's a pleasure for me to be with such, uh, in a, such an August audience and having such fantastic and eminent uh, panelists. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Anjali Sivramakrishnan, Managing Partner of Kocher & Co. Dubai. And I have about 20 years of experience advising clients on m and both inbound and outbound in India, as well as the Middle East. Excellent. Almost everywhere in the world. And we look forward to hearing from you about your perspective on where deals uh, will crystallize uh, in the Thank upcoming you. year. And which gets us already into the topic of our today's conversation. We're going to talk about... Uh, you know, as to where in terms of the markets after the record, record year last year, where will you see uh, the deal uh, space being very active as well as the sectors, right? What uh, can, can we learn from you about the sectors that you see forthcoming? And then also talking about the trends and challenges which are shaping uh, kind of the global market for m and We try to wear a global mask Right. Uh, however, we will certainly be able to drill down into markets, into specific topics as we go along. So, uh, Siddharth, uh, may we ask you, uh, you know, after the record year in, in M&A last year or one of the record years, uh, everybody is asking what's next. Right? While, while we see an increase in deal making, uh, is broad based uh, sectors and industries uh, be kind of the trend or is it a little bit uh, more narrowed down which sectors uh, are you seeing in focus uh, in the coming year in the in the current year sure, sure. Uh, th thanks conrad uh, i think as, as you mentioned i think 2021 was probably an unprecedented year for m a activity globally including in the apac region um and, and it's a fair question, right? Is that is that sustainable going forward? What is 2022 going to look like? Um, now, there are clearly some headwinds that we are seeing even early on in 2022, including sort of geo geopolitical environment, concerns around uh, debt levels in China, what have you, uh, the ongoing COVID pandemic, because that's also clearly not, not over yet. But I should say that many of the same tailwinds that we uh, saw in 2021 continue to exist in 2022. Uh, including sort of the liquidity and the capital availability that will uh, most likely drive the activity levels of 2022 as well. And at least I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist uh, and I feel that 2022 is still going to be a, a very robust year for deal activity uh, across the board. Uh, now, yeah. sort of getting into a bit more specifics, uh, Conrad, to your question on trends and, and themes, uh, I would say, uh, broadly speaking, I, I can sort of, I feel there are five sort of broad sectors that will drive a lot of the, lot of the activity in this part of the world and perhaps globally as well. The, the first is private capital. Uh, private capital is not just private equity, it's sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, infrastructure funds, what have you. So it's a very broad category of, uh, of capital. Uh, but as, as you know, the audience might already know, there is well over a trillion dollars worth of dry powder in the private equity space as of now. And this is not taking into account sort of the SPACs that have been listed. If you if you club that in, it's even uh, even a larger amount than that. So we, we will see the private capital side of things leading the charge in m and activity across the board this year. Uh, the second uh, sector that I'd like to point out is tech. Tech was extremely busy in 2021. I think it will remain uh, a busy sector in 2022 as well. Uh, just given sort of what we've gone through and continue to go through, I think businesses are recognizing the importance of digital transformation and they're focusing on securing technology and talent, which, which we'll speak to more later on, to speed their growth. So, so that's that's an area I, I, I feel we'll continue to see activity in. Pharmaceutical is, is a third one. Uh, naturally, it's captured a lot of sort of attention during the pandemic, but uh, more specifically, I think biotech and digital healthcare are two sectors where we continue to see activity in 2022 as well. Um, the fourth uh, sort of trend or theme would be in the energy and infrastructure space, including digital infrastructure, uh, which is really data centers, fiber, telco assets, and what have you. Um, I, I think we'll see a lot of activity in, in this sector, especially in emerging markets in, in sort of Asia and the Middle East. Uh, and in the renewable space, particularly driven by the focus on ESG, 
and energy transition and net zero uh, targets, uh, which, which is something we're going to discuss later on as well. Um, and, and the last sort of theme I'd, I want to just touch upon briefly is car um, g- Given the pandemic and what, what, what we've sort of seen over the last couple of years, uh, companies and businesses are increasingly focusing on their core activities and exiting businesses that are not delivering growth. So what this is going to result in is an increase in carve-outs and asset sales. So I think that's another uh, theme trend that we will see active in 2022. Yeah, so you see a continuation of the carve You know, in 2021, there was already a massive wave of carve-outs, of big carve-outs. Yeah. You will see that in the medical uh, industry uh, and what have you. So you will see, okay, you know, that's that's super interesting. Uh, you know, uh, Anjali, any, anything you want to add? I see you are nodding. <laughs> yes. So I think I think I tend to agree with what Siddharth has mentioned. And we've had a similar experience uh, both in the UAE as well as in India. So we found UAE to have the most volume of transactions in 2021. And looking at the current environment, uh, in our experience, UAE will continue to be the front runner for m and and private equity activity. In terms of deal volume, we saw the most active sector in 2021 to be oil and gas and the energy sector, followed by uh, chemicals and technology. Technology is everywhere nowadays. Uh, We've also witnessed in the Middle East a lot of consolidation of the banking sector. And some of the largest transactions and consolidation of banks have been in the UAE. And that's a trend that we think will continue because there are also obviously many, many large banks uh, than the demand uh, for the banking. Uh, m and activity in 2022, again, in terms of sectors, uh, I feel it, it's going to be focused on the government-related entity investments, which is, of course, the uh, foray of uh, m and activity in the Middle East. Uh, a lot of restructuring and digital transformation of businesses. Uh, this could be uh, across sectors, so health tech, biotech, ed tech, fintech. We have seen a number of transactions in all of these sectors. In terms of the private uh, sector, we've also seen uh, and we feel that there will be an overriding uh, uh, focus on digitalization to match the new remote working. So irrespective of the size of the business or the industry, there's been a very big shift on technology to ease the working of businesses. Uh, Moving to India, again, thanks to COVID, uh, this led to a universal acceleration of adoption of digital tools and services. And uh, like I mentioned, we saw several transactions are not just uh, investments, but also exits were delivered to private equity investors across the technology space, including clean energy, real estate tech, e-commerce, ed tech, and fintech. And we feel that in the Indian market, uh, the exit is going to continue. So there are several large e-commerce players that are uh, uh, eyeing for the IPO. So a lot of the large private equity FDI investors into India are expecting to receive exits in 2022. In 2021, we also saw several large companies doing outbound m and activity. And that's something that I feel will continue across 2022. Okay, so so and now you're going already, uh, you know, in the direction of my next question. Where do you see the growth happening in terms of M&A activities, be it uh, acquisitions, probably also di- more so divestitures, uh, IPOs, etc. You talked about UAE and India. Do you see any other markets globally where this kind of could be also a trend uh, that we're going to see many, many more uh, transactions happen? Now you are frozen, Anjali. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, yeah. I can. Uh, so I think I think uh, when I talk about UAE, because I'm based in the UAE, but I think we've seen a similar trend. Uh, again, uh, IPOs as well as strategic transactions, consolidations and restructuring across the GCC. So Saudi had several transactions. We saw transactions in Egypt. We saw transactions in Qatar happening. So I think the Middle East has been very active and I'm sure Siddharth can add as far as Asia is concerned, uh, but I do know of uh, other jurisdictions which have provided exits to private equity investors in a significant way. Yeah, Siddharth? 
Yeah, maybe, maybe really quickly on, on in Asia, then Conrad. Um, it's a slightly mixed bag in Asia, right? Uh, uh, starting with China, I think China is uh, facing some um, concerns, uh, or, or the investors rather are concerned about sort of debt levels, especially in the banking sector that I mentioned. Then there's also the government crackdown on uh, some of the sectors and companies that have spooked investors. But having said that, we're still seeing investments continue to flow into China. On the outbound side, uh, the U.S. market continues to be challenging uh, for various reasons for Chinese companies. But what it has resulted in is a shift in the capital outflows. So we are seeing a lot of regions like Southeast Asia, India, Africa, Latin America, uh, sort of uh, benefiting from the outflows from China. Uh, Japan is interesting. We are actually seeing a, a, a pretty uh, a interesting uptick in inbound activity in Japan, in, especially on the private equity side and the energy renewable side. So that that's interesting. And we expect to see that as a theme for 2022. Um, and outbound Japan has always been strong. Uh, so that will remain robust uh, into the US, including. And Southeast Asia is a bit of a mixed bag. Indonesia, Philippines have recently sort of uh, uh, come up with many investor friendly regulations to uh, um, attract foreign investment. So I think regionally as well, we'll see a robust deal activity into uh, Southeast Asia regions as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Jeff, uh, you could add to what we heard about uh, uh, the GCE and Asian uh, perspective. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you see in the more Western oriented world? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, and I think I agree with everything that Siddharth and Anjuli uh, said. And uh, so the bias is towards, I think, a very strong uh, 2022 and, and you know, in the, in the next couple of years. It's certainly M&A activity looks strong and there's a lot of dry powder and, and so on and all those dynamics are still i think still there i will i would mention that i think in the context of, of this kind of conversation looking forward that we really need to also talk about some of the headwinds um that are affecting the uh, uh just the, the the global dynamic and obviously everyone's aware of the of the tensions um uh you know with with ukraine and russia so that that plays into it and we've seen the you know we've seen the market react pretty dramatically uh over the past it's just increased volatility in general. Um, but I think it, it just economically speaking, you know, you've seen uh, a rise, a dramatic rise in inflation, certainly in the U.S. And I think that's uh, global to some extent. There's um, uh, supply chain uh, challenges in almost all industries. Certainly it's, it's hit the ones that I'm, I'm closest to uh, quite dramatically. Uh, and then it did, from an indicator standpoint, uh, and again, I'll sort of, I see the U.S. a little bit more closely, but um, the, the U.S. Treasury uh, yield curve, um, the ISM, uh, the, the, the uh, production index and demand indexes uh, are all showing signs that historically have uh, been sort of predecessors to uh, uh, to recessions. And of course, if there's a recession in the U.S., then you know that that obviously has a global impact. So anyway, I don't mean to be a naysayer. I, I, I agree that the bias is towards the growth. I just want to balance it a little bit, maybe with some um, uh, some of the the headwinds that I think the uh, the industry is going to see as well. Yeah, Jeff, that would be a big headwind, right? Uh, you are kind of uh, painting at the moment. Hopefully, it, we don't get there. But again, it's it certainly it needs to be acknowledged, right? That this, yeah, I hope it, I hope that's not that's not true. <laughs> no, no, let's fingers crossed. Anirvan, uh, what's your perspective? Sure, I, I think um, the as as soon as we kind of coming out of the COVID and after two years um, with the Russia Ukraine crisis, uh, it has shown that we're going to see more uncertainties in the future than we ever did before, right? So the uh, the global supply chain impact is going to be there. The second thing which Russia-Ukraine uh, sort of crisis has, and I'm going to focus on that primarily, um, is it's shown how vulnerable company dynamics can be and linked to geopolitical scenario, right? So the pullout of so many Western company, companies out of the Russian market is a big sign. And unfortunately, in the past, when companies, Western companies would pull out, there would be a vacuum which could not be easily filled. But nowadays, there are other companies that can easily fill in the gap that's been created by the companies that are withdrawing, right? So direct impact is going to be there on the energy, oil and gas sector for sure, you know, worldwide, because Russia is a key player in the oil and gas and energy sector. It doesn't matter where you are, whether it's Venezuelan oil, 
or whether it's uh, Nigerian oil or Saudi oil, wherever you are, there is going to be an impact. That's for sure. Which is why the number of MNAs and consolidations are likely to go into a wait and watch mode than to actually go through. The second thing is, and which a lot of people are aware of, at the same time, a lot of people are not aware, is high tech industry. A lot of the back office actually is in Russia and Ukraine. You know, so while India provides the kind of the middle office or the back office, a lot of the leading edge uh, technology, software development, technology development was taking place in Eastern Europe, Russia and, and the so-called the CIS, right? That is going to definitely be another sector that is going to be impacted. And the last one is uh, the the cash mobility or the, the cash flow. So while... Uh, I'm pretty certain that it is going to have impact on the European m and scene for sure. Over the next few months, it is going to be a, a verge of caution that it's going to go into and uh, mm. and it's going to have an impact you know, whether we like it or not. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much for for this point and you brought uh, Ukraine and Russia, the, the, the current uh, situation into the mix. And again, you're right, uh, the Ukraine. I've been working with a big software organization in the past there as well. Uh, and again, all of them are impacted. I'm, I'm talking to the head of Corp Dev, what his daily life is. He's no longer in the office, for sure. He's dealing with other things, uh, which, which will impact uh, certainly the technology sector, definitely. So uh, I think this is kind of, uh, you know, our intro to talk about uh, the trends in terms of sectors and markets. Uh, now let's talk about uh, the current trends and challenges shaping the global market. And we have a couple of perspectives here on divestitures, demergers, uh, and so on. Regulatory is going to be one of the topics we will be discussing. Supply chain uh, is a topic, ESG. And lastly, we're going to focus on human capital and culture. So. The first uh, kind of uh, question is, uh, this is, has already been mentioned by the panel, by you guys a couple of times, divestitures, demergers, right? At the outset of the pandemic, you know, cash rich uh, organizations, the bigger organizations, they had less of a trouble to actually uh, get access to capital uh, to uh, actually get some, some divestitures done in contrast to smaller, less efficient competitors. Do you uh, see this trend continuing that it's for the smaller organizations more difficult to get access to the capital that uh, the bigger the bigger organizations will continue? It has already been mentioned beforehand. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that uh, as to how you see that uh, play out uh, this year? Anirvan. Sure. Think, yeah. So uh, I'm going to take that uh, question and divide it into sort of two parts. One is the availability of cash, um, you know, um, keeping aside the current scenarios, whether it's pandemic or the Russian Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, there is actually um, the amount of cash that's available in the market, the liquidity that's available in the market. Uh, it's been never there. When I say never there, meaning the last few years, there's been a lot of money available in the market. And so that you pointed it out, so whether it's private equities or financial institutes, uh, pension funds, as well as PACs, there is no dearth of liquidity. The problem is getting the right, the right opportunity to invest. So that's there. The, the vestiture and carve-outs, I, I think prior to the pandemic, we saw larger companies like General Electric, like Philips, like Siemens, they actually had those carve-outs taking place, you know, move away from the non-core or the assets that are making money for the business. Uh, let's sell them, generate some cash, and let's use that cash to feed into the other business. The challenge over the last few years have been that we've got these startup scale-ups that have cha started challenging even the conventional industries like banking, like insurance, you know. These companies do not care what size or color of your organization is, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a large bank, you have lots of money. I'm still a challenger digital bank and I'm going to challenge you in every sense of the word, right? So which means that now all of a sudden the shareholders want you to start priming yourself and take out uh, components or assets or companies or part of the companies that you can sell. So gone are the days when we're going to see large conglomerates like GE and 
Philips and, and Siemens of this world, right? They are likely to be replaced by other behemoths like Amazon's or Apple, but that's a different story. They're still very limited in their focus. The second thing is going to be that there are a lot of companies that are there that have liquidity, that have access to cash, and they would like to buy your carve out, right? So while there is a pressure to do more carve outs, on the other side, there are more buyers that are there in the carve outs. Pandemic has just accelerated the whole process. You know, it has just pressed the pedal to make it uh, happen. And uh, yeah, I mean, that that's what I would say that we're going to see a lot more divestitures. Um, also, I think I would just add to that, and I'm sure uh, Siddharth and Jeff and Anjali would sort of uh, um, second that, which is in the past when MA was there, w w would take place, people or companies would not be aware that when you buy a company, you can also carve out a certain part of the company that you don't need, right? Yeah. That acknowledgement, that awareness was not big, especially in the mid segment, the $250 million in, and, and lower. That realization was not there. That realization has started coming in the last five, 10 years. And that's, we will see a lot more. For example, the new acquirers, they'll come in and say, by the way, I would want this part of your company, this part of your business, but we need to get rid of that part. And that is more likely to happen uh, in the near future. So that's, those were my, uh, th that's my input, yeah. Your five cents, thank you. Thank you, Anivan. My five uh, cents, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, uh, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, no, I think those are those are all very good points. I know I, I get calls. Uh, I mean, as a you know, as a court dev uh, person in a in a strategic uh, acquiring type of a of a business, I, I get calls a few times a month from uh, private equity and and similar uh, shops looking to uh, potentially acquire anything we might want to carve out or divest. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been true for a number of years. And <clears throat> excuse me, we don't we don't tend to do much divestiture. So I imagine my colleagues who do have more diverse uh, businesses, larger portfolios, they must be getting deluged. And of course, um, you know, the timing is quite good. It's a seller's market. So if you're, you know, all, I think, um, running a healthy portfolio of businesses, uh, you're always going to look at that. What's the, what's the still a good strategic fit for us and what uh, maybe is not, uh, is no longer a good strategic fit. And you want to try to exit those businesses when you can still get value from them, right? Don't run them into the ground as sort of this uh, black sheep of the, of the business, um, you know, and, and this is a great time to, to do that. So uh, I, I certainly, I certainly get that. And I think, again, that's a, no, a healthy, normal part of, uh, of running a business and the, and the timing is, is good. And of course, you know, you'd like, what you'd like to do is then take that capital, reallocate it towards another vector that you can then, you can then grow in. And, uh, you know, in, in our industry, just a, a recent example in, in, the, in the semiconductor, mostly semiconductor industry was Brooks Automation. Um, and you can easily Google that if you're not familiar with it. But they made a very, very big shift over the past few years uh, to from focusing on semiconductor into focusing on life science by spinning off, selling off and spinning off some uh, some large parts of the, of the business. In fact, what was at one point the majority of the business? I'm not saying everyone should do something maybe quite as drastic as that, but uh, but I think it's an interesting example of a really just, you know, a large refocus in terms of what they think uh, the best strategic growth opportunities are going forward. No, well, excellent. And this, uh, this is a very good perspective on, on your experience, uh, you know, and from a kind of corp depth as well as corporate strategy and investors perspective. We did not yet talk about activist investors. Yeah. Uh, Anirvan, you uh, quickly, you talked about it, not really, you didn't use the word. Did you think about it at that time where you told, told us about your perspective on investors? How, how active do you see them? I know, that, Jeff, that they are very active in the US, but they are also now extending their uh, you know, level of activity globally. So who wants to cover this uh, kind of question? Yeah, I, I, Carl, I, was, I was actually going to raise exactly that point uh, from an from a Asia perspective. Right? To, your, to your point, I think the activism in the U.S. is, I, I would say, back to the pre-pandemic levels, right? It's, 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 okay. it's, it's, it's fully, fully, fully on again. Uh, what's interesting is that we're seeing sort of glimpses of it in the Asian market as well. Uh, nowhere close to sort of the type of shareholder activism that you see in the U.S. and perhaps Western Europe, but... In, in markets like Hong Kong, for instance, right, where they have a more robust capital markets, we are sort of starting to see shareholder activism also play a part in um, 
how boards look at uh, you know creating shareholder value by divesting non-core businesses and what have you. So I think it's a very interesting time to uh, to sort of keep track of that and see how that impacts uh, how, how boards and companies react to divestitures and asset sales given the pressures from from shareholders. So I, I would say it's a it's a nascent market in Asia, but definitely something that's uh, that that we are beginning to see now. Excellent, excellent. Now. Let's turn the page. Uh, okay, uh, Anirvan, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I just one one more point that I wanted to add uh, on the shareholder activ activism. So, you know, if you roll back the clock like 20 years or 15 years back, right, uh, some of these larger companies, and, and you know, the fact that I worked with General Electric for 16 years uh, makes it, um, you know, I can get out of G, but G can't get out of me uh, kind of thing, right? So, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, ve very deeply ingrained. So what we used to see is the company, we used to say we are there in the business of making money and to support shareholders. Or like we are there to make profits for the shareholders, right? That motto, that mantra has changed because right now, uh, likes of Amazon and Apple do not talk about their shareholders only. They talk about user experience, customer experience, etc. So there is going to be a battle between what the shareholders want and what your customers want. And that is going to be a very, very interesting space, especially in the digital technology space, which has got a huge, huge engagement with users and consumers. So that's just something that I wanted to add. Excellent. Anjali, I know that you uh, uh, did witness uh, a big blow up in India, right? <laughs> because of activist investors. That's right. Can you tell sure. us about that? So I think I think uh, we have, all of us together, uh, as humans, have technology to thank. Because as Jeff and Siddharth mentioned, uh, the activism is at its peak in the United States. And that's where everybody's learning. Because now, because of the internet, everybody has started getting access to what's happening across the globe. And that's exactly what happened in Satyam, uh, one of the big IT companies in India, and this is about 15, maybe 18 years back, uh, where they took a very large piece of a divestment. So they were trying to carve out a business, uh, entire business uh, unit, and there were objections raised by the shareholders. They did not let that transaction go through. They uh, filed uh, FIRs, which are criminal proceedings against the promoters. And that's how one of the largest IT conglomerates actually came down. The government stepped in. And then of course, there's a long story which everybody can read. Uh, but the point I'm trying to drive home is that shareholder activism can make and break companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Conrad, I, I know we're running short on time, but just one one additional point on the shareholder activism, especially in a, in the Asian context, is uh, SPACs, right? With sort of the number of SPACs that are scouting for targets in Asia, uh, what, what that would result is in when when they de-SPAC these Asian companies becoming listed in the U.S. And that, that's where sort of the shareholder activism is, is sort of more active, right? And that's going to impact how these businesses that have just become public in the U.S. markets behave and react to shareholder activism. So I, I think that's another area to watch uh, where, where it might be impacted in Asia. Thank you very much. And we have our first question, guys, right? <laughs> May I just read it to you? Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so how do you see technology aiding and supporting the complex dynamics and streamlining the overall high stakes and M&A industry landscape? So technology uh, and the role of it, uh, you know, uh, it, it will have on, on, M on the M&A industry and this landscape. And we talked a little bit about technology in the beginning. So uh, Anirvan, uh, are you happy to take this question? Sure. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And and just before I did uh, did that, you know, Siddharth and Spack, uh, uh, you know, one thing we need to be careful about, or we need to be cautious about, is uh, Spack was heavily, uh, or there was a lot of Russian money involved in Spacks, and that's something that is going to not be available in the near future. So we need to keep that in mind. Back to this one. Uh, let's take this question and break it down into two parts. One is technology aiding the process of M&A life cycle itself, right? So whether it's project management tools or whether it's collaboration tools, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this um, 
uh, you know, in the near future in a merger where obviously is, is a great example of one of the tools that can be used. Um, and because of this program is sponsored by Mergerware, we could take their names and not take the others. Uh, but, you know, that's there. I think watch with respect to the industry, a lot of companies pandemic has shown their digital deficiency. And that is where they would be looking at upgrading their capabilities to become more technologically agile and more digital. And I think this is where we're going to see definitely the number of MNAs increase. And I think Siddharth, you already mentioned about that and that, Jeff, as well. Um, with respect to if technology can support complex dynamics and streamlining, apart from let's say, uh, virtual data rooms and project management. And uh, um, I don't still see the role of AI that big in the deals because a lot of the information around deals is still very discreet and not available in the public domain. And therefore, AI needs those. So so that would be my take that we still, we still need that human intervention when it comes to the complexity of uh, high stakes M&A industry. But can we facilitate the process of technology? Yes. Is the technology a sector where MA is going to increase? The answer is yes. But will it help in the decision making? The jury is out. I, I would still say wait and see. It still requires a human digital interaction, right? That's uh, yeah. probably more focus on human when it comes down to decision making on that. No, thank you very much for taking this question. So, which uh, gets us to the next uh, topic, uh, regulatory scrutiny and potential hurdles that companies might be, might be facing. You know, if a company cannot gain approval, if it's a multi-country cross-border transaction and you, you, you cannot get approval in, in several markets, would you see uh, an opportunity, or I wouldn't say opportunity, however, that you know, the M&A activity will be more pushed down to a local level rather than, you know, buying uh, companies that have a multi-country presence. So probably Siddharth and, and Jeff, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, Siddharth. Sure. Yeah, ha happy to go first. Uh, yes, no, uh, so I think I think it's, it's, it's an interesting topic, uh, Conrad, because what, what the pandemic has sort of resulted in is that uh, th there's now an increased uh, concern around national self-reliance, supply chain dependencies, and, and all of this sort of overlays the shifting geo geopolitical climate as well, which, which has sort of started to manifest in regulatory concerns around m and activities, right? And, and you correctly pointed out uh, these challenges on cross-border deals in particular. I think the two areas where this does come up and, and is, uh, we are seeing that as being a challenge for cross-border deals is FDI regimes across across multiple countries, jurisdictions uh, globally, and, and merger control. Um, ha having said that, I, I think that the way uh, the M&A landscape has evolved and is evolving, I, I don't see that you would see um, companies only resorting to sort of domestic M&A activity. I think it, it may be a bit more regional, perhaps not you know 17 countries or what have you, but I, Despite the challenges, I don't think cross-border M&A is going away anytime soon. I think you need to have cross-border m and for all of the reasons that we discussed earlier as well. But it, it is definitely more challenging now. Uh, and, and this is especially given the geopolitical uh, overlay to things. It's not as simple as back in the day when boards could be thinking about merger control that, oh, we'll just divest this part of the business or have behavioral changes there and we'll get clearances. It's no longer as simple as that, right? There are a lot more uncertainties in the market. So you need to have a, a well thought out plan A as well as a contingency plan B on how you address these challenges going forward. Well, that, that's crystal clear. Jeff, uh, what's your perspective on this? Thank you, Sita. Yeah, so Sarah so hits on, on really, I think the main point, and I don't, I would call it an elephant in the room with respect to regulatory, but you know, it's, it's really in your face very much so these days where, you know, in the past, you uh, you you when you're considering an, an acquisition, cross-border acquisition, uh, one that was going to require regulatory approval, um, you know, met those thresholds. You uh, you would typically look at market shares and look at potential for uh, uh, anti-competitive behavior and monopolistic concerns and things like that, and that would take the forefront. That is still an, obviously a, a major issue, but 
honestly, the geopolitical tensions, I think, really need to be addressed uh, up front when you're when you're considering a deal that may have those those implications. Uh, and we've seen, I mean, we have ample evidence of, of that already uh, globally. So, uh, you know, th there's the there's the, um, uh, the 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 you know, tension between countries aspect, but then there's also uh, the uh, supply chain, the the, uh, the drive towards bringing a lot of different supply chain to indigenous um, uh, situations, right? That is, there was a recent example where um, uh, Germany wouldn't approve of, they didn't decline it, they just didn't respond uh, to an acquisition uh, of a German uh, silicon wafer manufacturer, which is an important part, obviously, of making computer chips. Uh, by a Taiwanese company. Now that's not a Chinese company, but okay, well, you know, it's, you know, that's maybe one aspect of the concern, but also it could be as simple as Germany would prefer not to allow an important part, an important component of the supply chain for semiconductor to, to move offshore. In fact, just the opposite, they would prefer to have more, uh, uh, more onshore. So um, I think, you know, these aspects are, are really something to consider because you can spend a lot of time and money on a deal Bef well before you get, I mean, typically regulatory approval occurs, you know, after you've already, uh, you've already signed the deal and you haven't, you haven't closed and it's just a closing contingency, right? Uh, it needs much more attention than that uh, earlier on in the, in the process. Now, there was a, just one more quick example where, you know, in, in 2021, uh, China didn't even respond to applied materials acquisition of uh, attempt of acquisition of Kokosai, which is, again, big equipment makers, important equipment makers in the uh, semi-industry, uh, applied had to pay $150 million termination fee. So, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's some serious money. Uh, so, and, and not to mention all the time and attention they paid before that. So just a few things to consider. I think it's, it's really interesting time in, uh, with respect to regulatory. No, uh, again, thank you very much for, for your perspectives. Uh, it's always uh, uh, an issue. It can be an issue. Uh, frequently, it's it's not, but uh, it's a, certainly a topic to, to be taken into consideration and to be observed. Uh, Anirvan, you mentioned supply chain, and uh, Jeff, you mentioned supply chain as well. Uh, you know, do you see any trends, uh, you know, uh, coming down the road on the supply chain? I'm thinking about, uh, you know, acquisitions of technology companies that are specialized in supply chain uh, technology uh, and also uh, on data and analytics in that uh, space. Uh, do you see any kind of trends coming down the road uh, on that uh, on that front? Yeah, I think the last, uh, if you look at the last, let's say, 20, 30 years, maybe 40 years, uh, we, we saw that China became sort of the um the back office factory for the world you know it, it literally became that right and then over the last 10 15 years the sort of us china trade wars and the, the crisis meant that companies started looking at alternative uh, places from where to source the material right so that is definitely going to speed up uh, people are going to hedge their uh, their supply chain bets um, pandemic has just accelerated it uh, again as i said earlier um, so we're going to see a lot more um, uh, supply chain being managed from other parts. Uh, technology is going to play a huge, huge role because, again, it's the likes of blockchain and the origin source and all that stuff. More companies are going to talk about that uh, for sure. Um, so uh, technology uh, is going to play a role. There is going to be a geopolitical movement there. But more importantly, uh, I think what's also going to happen is, and we already see this in the US, uh, there is this, um, you know, I, I think it's Tesla who's invested a huge amount of money in uh, in in, uh, in Texas. Samsung is uh, uh, investing huge amount. So they are bringing in manufacturing sort of back in, into the US to essentially uh, hedge their supply chain bets. You know, they don't want to be held hostage with uh, trade wars. Uh, and, and that's where that's something that we definitely will see. How much of that is going to show up in Europe? I'm not sure yet. I think we will see some of that. But how big or small that's going to be, that's going to be a question for sure. Anurvan, uh, Intel just announced a big investment in uh, in Germany, in, in chip fabs in, in Germany. So I think there you go. And just as one, you know, one example, just on your last point there. Yeah. 
So guys, uh, and by the way, Tesla just opened up a, a new uh, car, uh, you know, uh, production yes, facility in Berlin. Right? Dancing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be risking a, a bit, right? <laughs> and by the way, we have a, a, a very interesting question in the chat. Uh, can you quickly show it on screen? Uh, what do you feel about the long-term impact on the ongoing military Social, social, socio-economic conflicts happening globally uh, on M&A cross-border landscape. That's a very relevant and current question. Jeff, do you do you have an opinion on that? I, I think I think we've certainly touched on a lot of those those aspects. I mean, I, I was mentioning the, the um, you know the regulatory impact. I think the <clears throat> the long-term impact of sort of the short-term um military activity probably you know may, maybe it isn't it doesn't really manifest itself quite in 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 long-term impacts on on m a but the global tensions that it that it creates or that precipitated the that that military activity that has um you know that has really significant uh impacts I, i've been i've typically been with um uh or at least in recent years i've been with companies that um uh, have been uh, international. My current company is based in Switzerland. Previous company was was in Sweden. You know, these are non-NATO countries. So if you're looking at um, uh, acquiring <clears throat> part of a business, for example, uh, or the whole business that um, is in <clears throat> is in a NATO country, and there's some aspect perhaps of uh, of defense or even you know high tech or anything that's considered competitively sensitive or uh, nationalistically sensitive. Um, uh, really, uh, you know, you, you could you could really run into some into some resistance uh, for that that part of the business. So it's definitely something to, you know, again to again keep in mind, um, not just from a regulatory, but even just you know from a, um, a cultural standpoint. You know, how how eager will uh, once that company is acquired uh, by you know uh, you know by a foreign uh, entity, how eager will the business partners be to continue the 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 um, uh, you know the current situation, the employees, and so on. So the, there's some interesting topics to consider. Oh, thank you, thank you very much for covering that. Yeah. So, would, yeah. Conrad, if I could add, uh, you know, because I was looking at the, reading the question, it talks about the long term impact um, versus the near term or the short term. Uh, in the short term, we definitely going to see, but in the longer term, I don't think there's going to be that dramatically a different way of doing things and the reason uh, why i say this is because yes in the western world we say oh my god it's happened in the western world but conflicts have been there you know whether it's afghanistan or iraq or iran uh, it's been syria it, it's been there um you know um civil wars in latin america or africa it's been there um has that made a difference it depends on how big or small the country is in terms of global supply chain and what's their contribution but even then, like, you know, the, the contribution of Ukraine to the global supply chain was very, actually, Iraq had more, a bigger contribution to the global supply chain than Ukraine has. I, I don't know the numbers, but I think that was what the scenario is. So in the longer term, Ukraine probably is going to become a higher risk country from an investment perspective than it was in the past. Uh, Russia may also become a higher risk country. Um, are we going to see a lot more investments in in Poland or in Hungary or in Romania, I doubt that. You know, not because not because there is a war, but because is there an industry that wants to invest in those countries in the first place? And if the answer is not really, then what has dramatically changed? What due to the conflicts there? So, yeah, and I, I just just to add to that, sort of, not to sort of uh, belabor this this question longer, but I think clearly the the immediate impact is a, a humanitarian one, right? It's just absolutely terrible what's happening. Not not really to do with deal activity, but just on a on, on a humanitarian level, it's it's very it's it's completely unconscionable to see what's happening in, in Ukraine at the moment. The the longer term impact, however, I, I feel is a very complicated question. And and there could be long term impacts on the world economy which we are not fully, which which are difficult to fully understand at present, and these could stem stem from the knock-on effects of the sanctions, which are which are growing uh, day by day, uh, food prices. Uh, another interesting development could be uh, sort of energy independence, a move towards renewables. I think that might actually result in M&A activity as well. But these are sort of more longer-term impacts of sort of what's happening right now 
which we may not be able to fully sort of appreciate uh, just yet. Yeah, well, it makes makes a lot of sense, and in particular looking at the humanitarian aspects of that, uh, which uh, which are terrible. Yeah. So thank thank you guys, very very well addressed and answered. I think I personally think hopefully uh, VJ as well, <laughs> the one who asked the question. So let, let's continue with uh, ESG. Anjali, I'm looking at you here. So ESG is, is out there for quite some time. Uh, can you talk a little bit how you see companies addressing that during a transaction from early on, the strategic phase, the due diligence, and also then probably later on? And did you already see uh, an organization walking away from a deal because of their scrutiny on environmental, social, and government uh, governance aspects. And probably if you could also draw a little bit of a, uh, a conclusion out of your findings, which topics are focused uh, most? Uh, is it, uh, to, to my experience, is it's environmental, right? Uh, net zero and what, what have you. The social aspects, so and so, and governance probably as well. So that that's a long question. Sorry for that. Sure. <laughs> No, thank you so much. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer this question in two parts. I'll first talk about India, and then I'll talk about the UAE. Uh, and I'll begin by answering the second part of your question, whether we have actually seen a transaction where the acquirer walked away. And the answer yeah. to that question is yes. I'm not going to take names for confidentiality reasons, but this was one of the largest automotive companies of Japan that was looking at taking over 100% acquisition of a, a motor, motor parts company in Chennai, which is the hub of automotive activity in India. And this was a very long diligence. I think it lasted for over uh, six months of uh, various aspects. It was not just the legal diligence, but the commercial, the operations, and the big red flags were on the environment side. Uh, because obviously the Japanese company had very high standards. They had a very, very long checklist. And I remember we were the counsels for the acquirer. And when we send those questions, that entire questionnaire to the uh, representatives of the target company, they did not even know what it means. So that, and this is of course, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try and uh, downplay it. This was about 15 years back. So of course, India has come a full circle and now companies are much more aware. Uh, in terms of ESG compliances, in fact, very recently, uh, SEBI has come out with a mandatory ESG filing. So all top thousand uh, companies in India are required to publish and report their various standards of ESG compliance. And there are various criteria that have been laid down. But the point I'm trying to drive home is that uh, most people did not take this very seriously. Of course, the West adopted it much, much better than uh, developing countries like India. And there have been not just uh, at the acquisition stage, but post acquisition. So when you have large foreign companies that are acquiring uh, global companies, so you, they would have many of the transactions that we uh, assist foreign clients with have a subsidiary in India, which is not a very large uh, part of the deal value, but it's a very large part in terms of the actual people that are based in India. So they either have a back office in India, so therefore, there's a lot of compliance that they are required to look at from an India perspective, and it's less than 5% of the deal value. So it's a really annoying or an irritant as far as Global Council is concerned or the leaders of the m is concerned, because it's always India that's being flagged, whether it's a regulatory uh, challenge, whether it's a compliance issue. Uh, but yes, we have seen in time, and in fact, now uh, many SME companies, so in India, government of India, has uh, brought out a lot of funds uh, where they are doing impact investing. So if certain companies, MSE, MSME companies, if they are meeting certain ESG parameters, they can draw up, draw up the funds from these Government of India sponsored funds. So there is much more awareness of compliance towards ESG. And what that does is if you get into, as a company, if you get into compliances on the ESG side, and you take them very seriously, then you also become a very good target for m &A activity. So it's not something that you're gearing up when the acquirer is looking at you, but you're already prepared. On the yeah. flip side, if you come to the UAE, 
Uh, UAE, of course, is uh, VSS is a signatory to many of the international treaties, and they like to follow the West. So a lot of the standards and the norms and the regulations are uh, tabled and they are formed as per what is uh, done in the US and in, the, in England. Uh, and that's why the ESG has been adopted uh, despite being a very small country. It has been adopted very much more favorably and the most uh, companies are very, very much aware of the standards and the compliances. And of course, the laws have pushed that as well. So that's uh, that's my uh, take on ESG. No, no, that's excellent. And uh, we, we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, sure. If we could move uh, to uh, the last uh, topic that I mentioned in the beginning, which is all about human capital, people and culture. Anirvan. Can you talk a little bit about the importance that you see uh, in the current uh, environment, looking at uh, people, uh, you know, talent and culture, not only looking at the pandemic uh, and uh, the current crisis uh, that we are seeing, but also more in general, what is, what is your experience and what are organizations doing around that? Sure. Um, you know, I'll just divide it into three parts. First part is culture is a strong factor when it comes to cross-border uh, transactions. And I was just listening to Anjali and the, literally, you know, I, I actually remembered a few of the transactions that I was involved in. Um, so it's, you know, Japanese have high standards about uh, everything, you know, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, playing by the rule, uh, they've got uh, lots of documentation, etc. whereas Indian companies or Chinese companies for that matter may not be as much, right? Um, uh, many years back, I was involved with an European company trying to buy an asset in Malaysia. It was more to do with cultural clash than anything else, you know, because when when I got involved, I was like, what did you expect? This is a Malaysian company. You know, this is the way they operate. If it does not suit you, then yeah. it is a cultural difference rather than regulatory or monetary difference. Regulatory difference, ESG differences, absolutely agreed. But it's more cultural mind feel. If you can't navigate that, then you should not get into this. So that, that's number one. Number two is people forget that when large companies buy a small company, culturally, they're very different. Large company is all about rule-based command and control, but a smaller companies tend to be entrepreneurial. You know, they are trying to scale up. They're trying to do more uh, customer acquisition, etc. Whereas large companies, they're trying to stabilize. They're trying to focus internally. They want to increase their profitability. So culturally, they're different, right? And the third part I would say is, Culture is not a single entity, but a combination of several things. And I'm, and uh, this is something that I teach in my uh, M&A lessons. Culture essentially is made up of geography culture, industry culture, organization culture, team culture, individuals. And then on top of that, you've got competing values, you know. And, and the, this is what makes a total package of culture. So when people are talking about cultural differences, you need to start with competing values. If the competing values don't match, forget about the, 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 the culture of individuals on the ground because they're going to clash. You know, so uh, this is my kind of long and short because I, was, I, I also want other people to say, uh, something as well, uh, but I, I could go on for hours on this one. <laughs> this is one of my favorite topics. Yeah, uh, we have a minute left. Uh, uh, any of you who can, who cannot wait to <laughs> touch upon culture and the people topic? Jeff, how are you uh, typically uh, looking at this? <clears throat> yeah, th those are all very good points. I'm not sure I can uh, add too much uh, to it, but but obviously, you know, when you look at uh, you look at the success rate of uh, of uh, M&A activities, it's typically not at the level that people would like it to be. And when you ask practitioners why they think a deal uh, failed, uh, the, the the most common answer tends to be they point to cultural issues. That said, it's it's not like uh, solving a problem with the um, financial diligence or something, right? I mean, cultural is much harder to get your arms around and, and you know, people know it when they see it kind of a, uh, kind of a situation. So, uh, but I have seen, there's so much attention being paid to that, uh, to that topic. And I think rightly so, uh, because people are trying to figure out better ways to manage 
um, to manage the cultural integration of different businesses. And it's not just, by the way, uh, I think Anurvan makes a great point about it's not just uh, different, you know, uh, uh, geographic cultures. It's also size uh, the, and, and, and just the business practices and the in, industry within different industries, there could be different cultures. So I, I when I look at culture, I'm thinking in a very broad definition of the uh, yeah. uh, of the word because any of those uh, uh, any of those aspects can cause uh, can cause post deal uh, problems uh, post closing problems. So. Excellent. No, no, thank you very much for this uh, summary. And uh, this is my uh, experience as well. I'm working at the moment on one of the biggest kind of uh, acquisition activities that is going on in the world. And again, we are receiving more and more culture assessment and uh, you know kind of preparation post merger uh, implementation rfps from clients which was uh, not normal uh, probably from japan already 15 years back from now when i started right <laughs> but now it, it has arrived in the us everywhere you know, in the middle east uh, in europe and again it's 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 uh, i call it an archipelago right i've been to in indonesia and learned it's an many many different islands and Anirva, you, you mentioned it and framed it so nicely uh, no, thank you very, very much for uh, participating. I'm honored to have been now uh, on this panel to moder moderate the panel together with you guys. Excellent perspectives. So thank you very, very much. And uh, with this, I think we are ready to close our session. Thank you. Thank well, that you. was an amazing. That was an amazing discussion. So thanks a ton Conrad for moderating. Also, thanks a ton to all the panelists for the thought-provoking discussion. I'm sure that this leaves us with a yearning for more MA insights. In the year 2022, there is certainly a lot to look up to as an eminent professional. The demand for digital business transformation and innovation seems to be the key driving force for MA across all industries this year. We also expect the need to stay up with technology and improve efficiency to keep firms running smoothly and will continue to be a significant driver of transactions across the board with today's rising workforce. As we progress towards a more contactless society and explore new methods to collaborate cooperatively from many locations, COVID-19 has also underlined the need of innovation. So with this, we have finally come close to the end of this summit. I'm sure that there have been a lot of takeaways from today's MA summit. We would like to thank you very much for attending today's event. I hope that our audience found the summit insightful and also that they found value in hearing from the industry experts and deal makers from around the world. So thanks again, everyone, including our guest speakers, our sponsor, our dancers, and everyone else who has helped us in making the summit a great success. Thank you again, and we wish you all a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks, Conrad. Thanks for the Thank panel. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.